Может быть, мгновенья, может быть, века. Не кукуй, кукушка, не буди подружку. Пусть в моей ладони сладко спит ее рука. Добрый утро, Атлантис Мир. Хьюстон, Атлантис Мир. Доброе утро, Дэн. Спасибо большое. I think there's a few Larissas around the world that'll be proud to hear that we played a song for them this morning. And how appropriate that there's a line in there about uh, alarm clocks. Uh, we've, uh, as you know, not really needed alarm clocks the last couple of days, but uh, we're up and at them and ready to go for another great day. Thanks for the music. Currently, the shuttle Atlantis is orbiting the Earth, firmly locked to the Mir space station, as this live downlink from payload bay cameras aboard the shuttle indicate. In view is the orbiter docking system, linked up to the uh, docking mechanism of the Crystal Science module with its omnidirectional antenna clearly in view in the upper left-hand corner of this picture. And in the rear of the shuttle's cargo bay, the Space Lab Science Module, where mission specialists Bonnie Dunbar and Ellen Baker have begun perhaps the busiest day of the five days of joint scientific operations on tap for the 10 astronauts and cosmonauts aboard the 225-ton Atlantis Mir space complex. and we're now getting live TV from the Space Lab showing the Mir 18 crew uh, back in the lab along with Commander Hood Gibson floating in the foreground uh, as uh, mission specialists Ellen Baker and Bonnie Dunbar perform uh, a variety of activities, mostly metabolic experiments. Yes. Vladimir Dzhurov, the Mir 18 commander, is seen uh, next to Dunbar on the right-hand side of the picture. Hood Gibson is in the foreground. In the uh, rear of the picture is the Mir-18 flight engineer. He's partially obstructed from view right now. Now coming back into view, that's Gennady Strekalov, the Mir-18 flight engineer. Pilot Charlie Precourt is back there as well, along with uh, U.S. astronaut Norm Thaggard, who's wrapping up his fifth flight into space, of course, of the last three and a half months having been spent aboard the Mir space station. Uh, on board Mir at the moment are the Mir 19 crew who replaced Thagor Dzhurov and Strekalov. That's Anatoly Soloviev and Nikolai Budarin. They're in the, uh, in the process of uh, checking out many of the Mir's systems, continuing their handover from the Mir 18 crew as they begin to set up shop for their two-month stay aboard the Mir. They'll be relieved by another cosmonaut crew in late August. Atlanta Space Lab, Mir, we're back with you, Tedris West. Atlantis, we confirm a nominal firing. Yeah, we can confirm the forward ones. Roger that. Okay, great. Copy, Dave. Six through 11, and then we'll stand by. Uh, I guess the data from the um, part one looks okay so far. Atlantis Hoot, uh, you acquired exactly the data that we needed procedurally. It was just fine, and we're still evaluating the data. We have no reason to think there's any problem. Okay, copy. We'll press on. This is a special report from CNN. I'm John Holloman at CNN Center in Atlanta. 
We're about to um, go up about 217 miles above the surface of the Earth to the core module of the Mir space station, where the 10 shuttle and uh, Mir astronauts and cosmonauts are waiting to spend about 15 minutes with us. We have to share our time with somebody else, so we have to use the 15 minutes as effectively as we can. I'm going to start with Commander Hoot Gibson, who just had a new baby daughter, Emily. As I told you a second ago, Hoot, it's, it's nice to have new children. How would you, when Emily gets to be eight years old, explain what happened on this mission to her? Well, John, I suppose she's probably going to grow up hearing all about it, so by the time she's eight years old, she's probably going to be tired of hearing about it, but uh, I, guess, uh, I guess I'll tell her and, and grandchildren that that it was perhaps the proudest moment of my life to be able to take part in, e in an event such as this and an event uh, the likes of which we haven't, haven't tried to do, uh, haven't dreamed of for over 20 years now. Uh, it's certainly been the piloting challenge of my career and the, and the, uh, and the flight operations challenge of, of my entire career to get to take part in, in an event like this. And... Uh, I'm really proud of the crew that I got to go up with and the folks on the ground that helped put it all together. And uh, I guess I'll try and convey all of that to, to little Emily as she gets bigger. Yeah. How tough a job has it been, really? You said it was the piloting challenge of your career. Tell me how it was during the docking in, in the last few seconds of that. And, uh, and tell me if you had time to listen or feel the two ships coming together. Uh, there's a, we, I've got a fax in from a viewer in Russia who wants to know the, the sensations that you felt and heard and sensed as you were completing the docking. Uh, John, I'll, I'll tell you what we felt from over on the shuttle side, and make sure you ask the, uh, the Russian crew, uh, the Mir-18 crew, what they felt, because I think they noticed more at the actual moment of docking than we did. Um, the, the most demanding part of the, of the whole rendezvous, I felt, was when we intercepted the, the alignment cone that we needed to fly up in and stay within that alignment cone. Uh, there, was, there was a fair amount of maneuvering and a fair amount of thrusting that we had to do with the, uh, with the orbiter Atlantis to get it established and safely within that corridor and keep it there. Uh, once we had it there, it was a lot easier to keep it in the corridor than I thought it was going to be. Uh, and we were able to fly a pretty accurate approach uh, all the way up. And the closer we got, uh, the more I was able to determine that we were going to be able to fly it very accurately and precisely. And so, uh, and so it went very smoothly from that point on. Uh, at the actual moment of contact, we didn't feel the docking mechanism capture or the actual contact when we first uh, contacted the mirror. We fire a number of thrusters for about three seconds straight. So, of course, we heard the thrusters and felt the thrusters firing. Uh, but in terms of actual thump or actual contact, it was uh, a little bit of a letdown, although the, the word letdown really doesn't fit here. But uh, there wasn't a bang or any kind of a clunk that we could hear other than the thrusters firing. Yeah, why don't you pass the microphone over to Norm, and, and I'll ask him the same thing, and then he can pass the mic to Vladimir, who um, was over there as well. Norm. Um, it's interesting to me. We've asked our viewers around the world to fax in questions. They all want to know what it feels like, what it smells like, a lot more than, you know, the scientific things that are going on there. Tell me, from your position on board Mir, uh, what it felt like when, uh, uh, when Hoot piloted the shuttle into the side of your space station. Well, John, I've got some good comparisons. I've been here when we had a progress resupply ship dock, and when that occurred, I was probably a foot away from the node where it impacted. I felt nothing, I heard nothing. When the spectrum module docked with the station, that's about 20 tons, we felt a very slight vibration, but really felt nothing. When the shuttle docked, we felt it. The 100 tons uh, hitting the station had some uh, impact on us, and it was pretty impressive given the mild uh, sensations with the previous vehicles. Yeah, okay, this is a question for Vladimir, then I'm gonna come back to Norm, just to let you know where we're going here. Um, Vladimir, uh, you uh, had never spent time on board uh, a space station with Americans before. Was it much different, and is, was it much different with uh, Dr. Norm Thaggart there doing all these sophisticated medical tests on you the whole time you were together? Это вопрос Владимиру. По нашему понятию, вы никогда не были раньше на космической станции с американцем. 
А были ли какие-нибудь разницы? Были, был, отличалось как-то быть там с американцем Норд Тегартом? No, there weren't any problems. We had a uh, common language even when we were on Earth, so we worked together very well and uh, implemented the program jointly. We didn't really feel any difference that there was an American on board or, or you know, that he was any other nationality. So there were never any serious problems or, uh, or misunderstandings. Um, back to Norm Taggart for a minute. How much of a problem has it been for you, Norm, to be weightless for so long? And uh, what sorts of things have you done that our viewers might, who follow the space program might not know that you might have done special this time to counteract the effects of weightlessness on your body? The Russians have had folks up for long duration space flights, so they have a number of recommendations, and I tried to follow most, if not all, of them. We wear some devices around uh, uh, our upper thighs that are supposed to help with, uh, with the problem of fluid redistribution after uh, return to Earth. We exercise two times a day, and I actually, for many days, exercised a full hour, and that's actual time, either turning on a bicycle or running on a treadmill or walking on a treadmill. And uh, in addition to that, they also use a device that folks may not be familiar with called a lower body negative pressure device. We've used it uh, many times in the past to evaluate the status of the heart in zero-g. The Russians actually use it for training, thinking that it helps people with, again, the problem of orthostatic hypotension, medical term, but in practical terms, that means when you stand up, the tendency to feel like you're going to pass out and fall over. Uh, and what that does is you get inside a device that completely encloses the lower half of your body. A differential pressure is created and actually sucks the blood into the legs to create the same sort of distribution of blood in zero G that the normal person would have standing in one G. I've done all those things, and I hope it, I hope it helps, and I guess I'll find out in about a week. Yeah, you expected to be in space about 90 days. You've been up uh, nearly, nearly four months now. How much of a hardship has that been for you and for your family on a personal level? I miss my family a lot. Uh, I've depended on them for support, and I've gotten it through the years. It's tough to be away from home. I spent a year in Vietnam. I guess I spent nearly four months here. Uh, it's something that you feel you have to do, but you also realize you're making sacrifices when you do it. And they sacrifice, too. And I feel badly sometimes that uh, I get to have all this fun. So to some extent, the sacrifice is worth it. They don't get that benefit. Well, I'm going to come home and probably stay home a little longer this time. And I, I miss them, and I look forward to seeing them. Take a couple of cop days. Why don't you do that? That's what I'm going to do at the end of this mission as well. This, this question for Nick Budarin is the... Um, the rookie in the, uh, in the Atlantis crew, you've been there for uh, about a week now. What do you miss most about the planet Earth? Это вопрос господину Бударину. Вы уже на космосе находитесь, вы находитесь на космосе примерно неделю уже. О чем вы скучаете на Земле? Well, to tell you the truth, I don't have an opportunity to miss anything. There's a lot of work. We have a period of changing the, the guard, as it were, and a lot of things to do t after the shuttle leaves. We will immediately prepare uh, our spacesuits for an EVA uh, in the middle of July. So uh, we're not going to have uh, too much, I'm not going to have too much time to miss anything. <laughs> well, it must be beautiful from up there. Uh, we all watched the docking the other day, and it was thrilling to see it went so flawlessly, Commander. I am curious, you had practiced it in simulation so many times. How did the real thing compare to the simulation? Karen, that's a real good question. The, uh, the real thing was, if anything, perhaps a little bit easier than all of the simulations because uh, in all of the simulations we have a visual system that, that displays what the view out the window would look like. Uh, we have a number of computer systems in the simulator that have to play together and they frequently are, how do I put it, they're frequently less than perfect and uh, we wind up having to extrapolate a little bit and assume a little bit when we're doing the simulations. 
in actually flying the flight and actually flying with the onboard systems and all of the the computers working correctly and working properly, in addition to being able to look outside and see where the station really is, see what the view really is telling us, uh, we have a whole lot better information than what we have in the simulator. So in, in some ways it's easier to do when you actually fly it. Commander, if you would pass the microphone to uh, Norm Thagard, I would like to ask the doctor about his experience in space after so many months, three months. I understand that there are some physical changes on the body. There's concern about, what is it, an anemia and maybe some, uh, some weight loss. Uh, have you noticed any changes in your body during that period of time? You do get uh, perhaps what would be considered an anemia, I, I suppose. What happens is uh, you get almost what would amount to a blood transfusion because all the blood that's normally sequestered in the legs redistributes to the upper body. And I think blood per cell production probably shuts down for a while. But as soon as those old blood cells start dying off, then you start producing new ones. So I doubt that there are really fundamental changes in the blood. Some question about whether there are immuno immunological changes. The white cells, at least in the test tube, don't seem to be as active as they would be in a person who had not gone into zero G. Uh, my true crewmates lost their weight. In fact, uh, Velojin Gennady, I think, at first actually maybe gained a little. I lost a little bit of weight, but I thought I'd put that back on right away after I get back. There are changes, but none of them seem to preclude staying in space for about as long as you would want to. If there are limitations, they may have to do with calcium loss from bone and obviously the radiation that you experience up here over time. Dr. Thaggard, if you would pass the microphone to... Good morning, Atlantis Mirror. This is Terry Casey, WJKS Jacksonville. How do you hear me? Good morning, Terry. We have you loud and clear. Wonderful. Good to talk to you all. Thank you for the time. Question for Norm Thaggard and Nikolai Budarin, and if both of you would respond in English, it would be appreciated. Who's running that thing up there right now? All ten of you are in the mirror. The shuttle is uh, actually running it, and I assume the shuttle's on autopilot, maintaining the orientation of the shuttle, uh, the whole complex, rather, and it has to do that because the mirror station depends on its solar batteries for electrical energy, and they have to point to the sun. This is actually what I'd like to hear the response from both you, Dr. Thaggard, and uh, your, your comrade, Budaran. NASA's budget is facing dramatic cuts over the next several years. We've got some headhunters in Congress who want to kill this mission. You're in phase one of it. Russia is politically unstable. Anything could happen anytime. Given all that, do you all feel that you're fighting the odds up there, both, both you personally and what you're trying to do? Well, just think for a moment what it took to make all of this happen. Think of the technology that were required, and remember that a lot of that technology has other uses on Earth. And in fact, a lot of what we take as commonplace on Earth uh, is directly attributable to developments that came about through space research. Uh, the communication satellites we use when you pick up a phone to make a long-distance call, that's dependent on satellites that came out of space research. There are a number of uh, medical items, uh, most of them smaller medical items, but nonetheless useful, that have uh, been developed first uh, and depend on research and developments that occurred in space research. There are a whole long list of things, uh, but at the last, I think it's the spirit of human adventure, the desire to explore, and you either move forward or you move backward. You can't stand still. This program moves forward. And as... Uh, Space Lab Houston Park. We have a uh, good live downlink at this time on TVC One. Okay, we copy. 